As a medical student, the sheer number of name structures in the human body can seem totally overwhelming. Not least the hundreds of blood vessels that you require to learn in order to pass your exams. In this two-part series, we're going to help out a little bit by giving you a quick run-through of the major blood vessels in the human body, starting with the arteries. My name's Connor, and welcome to Anatomy 101. Before we get started, a shameless plug for our channel. As you can imagine, making these tutorials is very time-consuming, and as it stands, only around 40% of you watching are currently subscribed. Take a second to click the subscribe button under this video before we go on. It's completely free and it gives us incentive to keep making excellent anatomy tutorials for you. Okay, let's get into it. We're going to start by considering the heart as the centre of the cardiovascular system, so let's get some adequate exposure. The heart sits in the thorax, anterior to the vertebral bodies. Its most superior part is approximately in line with the T4-T5 intervertebral disc, and its most inferior part is in line with the T8-T9 disc. This varies a bit with positioning and respiration, but it's a pretty good average. There are four main groups of vessels that are involved in carrying blood into and out of the heart. Draining into it are the pulmonary veins and the superior and inferior vena cavae, and draining out of it are the pulmonary artery to the lungs and the aorta to the rest of the body. Today, we're going to look at the aorta and its branches. The aorta can be divided into three segments. From proximal to distal, these are the ascending aorta, the aortic arch, and the descending aorta. From the aortic arch, there are three recognisable branches. The first and largest is the brachiocephalic trunk. This will later branch to supply the arm and head on the right side, and thus derives its name from brachio, meaning arm, and cephalo, meaning head. Next, we have the left common carotid, which will supply the head and the neck on the left side. This gets its name from the Greek root karos, which means sleep or stupor, deriving from the fact that blockage of this artery leads very quickly to loss of consciousness. Lastly, we have the left subclavian artery, which supplies the left arm. Here's a demonstration of how the aorta relates to the heart. See how its descending part passes posteriorly. While in the thorax, the aorta produces a number of small branches, the most important to be aware of right now are the 3rd to 11th posterior intercostal arteries, which supply their corresponding intercostal spaces. The thoracic aorta passes through the diaphragm at the level of T12, and when it does so, it becomes known as the abdominal aorta. As the aorta passes through the abdomen, it produces several branches that come out laterally and anteriorly. The lateral branches we're concerned about here are the renal arteries, which supply the kidneys, and the gonadal arteries, which supply the ovaries or testes. There are also a number of lumbar arteries, which are similar to the posterior intercostals, but we won't cover these in any more detail. Coming off the anterior face of the abdominal aorta are the three trunks that supply the gastrointestinal tract. These are the celiac trunk, which supplies the foregut, the superior mesenteric artery, which supplies the midgut, and the inferior mesenteric artery, which supplies the hindgut. Here's how all that fits in with the vertebral column. At around the level of L4, the abdominal aorta bifurcates into two divisions, the paired common iliac arteries. These themselves divide into the external iliac arteries, which supply most of the lower limb, and the internal iliac arteries, which supply the pelvis and reproductive organs. As the external iliac artery passes under the inguinal ligament and thus leaves the pelvis, it becomes known as the common femoral artery. Let's follow the common femoral artery down into the lower limb. The common femoral produces two main branches to the leg. The first is the superficial femoral artery, sometimes just called the femoral artery. This is largely responsible for the blood supply of the anterior compartment of the thigh and passes posteriorly to the knee to become known as the popliteal artery. It also produces a branch known as the deep femoral or profunda femoris artery. This produces branches that are mostly responsible for supplying the posterior compartment of the thigh. Branches of the deep femoral artery include the lateral circumflex femoral, which has an ascending branch to the hip and a descending branch, and the medium circumflex femoral artery, which also supplies the hip. Continuing inferiorly, we can see the popliteal artery sits just behind the knee. This artery gets its name from the Latin word for ham due to its close association with the hamstring muscles. The popliteal artery produces three main branches, 
the posterior tibial, which supplies the posterior compartments of the leg, the fibula, which supplies the lateral compartment, and the anterior tibial, which supplies the anterior compartment. The anterior tibial artery also produces a dorsalis pedis branch, which runs over the dorsum of the foot. The posterior tibial and dorsalis pedis arteries are commonly palpated during a cardiovascular exam. Okay, let's go all the way back to the heart and look at those branches that came off the arch of the aorta. The brachiocephalic trunk gives rise to two arteries. The first runs deep to the clavicle bone, so is known as the right subclavian artery, and the second goes up to the neck to supply the head and is known as the right common carotid. An important branch from the subclavian artery is the thyrocervical trunk, which supplies part of the thyroid and some surrounding muscles. Other branches include the vertebral artery, internal thoracic artery, and costocervical trunk. Don't forget that the common carotid and subclavian arteries on the left side arise directly from the aortic arch. Let's follow the subclavian artery into the arm. The proper name for our armpit is the axilla, so as this artery passes through the armpit, it is known as the axillary artery. It continues down the medial aspect of the arm, and at the level of teres major, it becomes known as the brachial or arm artery, which supplies the anterior compartment of the arm. The axillary artery produces two important branches, known as the posterior and anterior circumflex humeral arteries. These do a similar job to the circumflex femoral arteries in supplying blood to the neck of the humerus. And the brachial artery produces a branch known as the deep brachial or profundo brachii artery, which supplies the posterior compartment. This continues down the lateral arm as the radial collateral artery and then the radial recurrent artery. Lastly, on the medial side, the brachial artery produces a branch that travels around the back of the elbow and is known as the superior ulna collateral artery. Okay, we're nearly done. In the forearm, the brachial and superior ulna collateral arteries join to produce the ulnar artery, which supplies blood to a lot of the anterior compartment of the forearm. On the lateral side, the radial recurrent artery joins the brachial to produce the radial artery. This mostly helps to supply blood to the posterior compartment. Eventually, the radial and ulnar arteries join in the hand to produce the deep and superficial palmar arches. From the ulnar artery comes the common interosseous, which branches into anterior and posterior divisions. These sit either side of the interosseous membrane, which is between the ulna and radius, and again mostly supply the posterior compartment. Okay, let's follow our last major artery. This is the common carotid artery and runs up either side of your neck to supply your head and neck. It is better viewed from the side. It doesn't produce any branches until it reaches your jawbone, at which point it splits into the internal and external carotid arteries. The internal carotid supplies the brain, but today we're going to focus on the branches of the external carotid. There are eight of these to remember, but don't worry, we have a helpful mnemonic which will come out at the end. The first branch is the superior thyroid artery, followed by the ascending pharyngeal. Next we have the lingual, which supplies the tongue, and the facial, which supplies the lower part of your face. The occipital artery supplies your occiput, and the posterior auricular supplies the back of your ear. And finally, the maxillary artery passes deep to the maxilla to produce numerous important branches and the superficial temporal supplies your temple. The mnemonic we'll use to remember this is some anatomists like freaking out poor medical students. This is very true, and it should help you remember it when it comes to revision time. Okay, that was a whistle-stop tour of all of the major arteries of the human body. In future sessions, we'll cover the abdominal blood supply, pelvic blood supply, and branches of the internal carotid artery in more detail. Also keep your eyes peeled for part two of this series, where we'll cover the major veins. For now though, get yourself a cup of tea and see how many of the arteries we've discussed that you can still remember. If you enjoyed the session, remember to subscribe and have a great day.